For generations, the womb has been a sacred environment where the fetus grows and develops. And the dark, quiet sanctity of the womb, the child grows from a cluster of cells into a full-grown baby. Organs develop, the structures are kneaded together as the fetus is fearfully and wonderfully made, far from the riches of man. With advances in technology, we can now look into the womb and see as the fetus develops and grows with ultrasound and MRI. But in addition, we can now actually go into the womb to interact with the fetus, to provide treatment and even surgery. This has opened up the world of fetal surgery, a world that I'm privileged and blessed to be part of. There are very few things really that gets many women more excited than the realization that they're pregnant. But the excitement and joy that comes with the pregnancy can easily be cut short by realization that that fetus may have an anomaly. The hopes, expectations, and dreams for that child are put into question. Several questions arise. Will this anomaly result in the fetus not even making it through pregnancy? Is this an anomaly that can be corrected after birth? What personnel or facilities need to be present at the time of delivery? Where should this child be delivered? Can this be corrected at all? Can it be corrected before birth? Now with fetal surgery, we're able to provide answers that did not used to exist, answers that we could hope that we can offer for many of these families that are faced with this condition. My journey into this world started halfway around the globe in Nigeria, where I was born and raised. You see, as a, <laughs> as a young boy growing up in Lagos, while a student at King's College Lagos, I had a very strong interest in science and medicine in particular. I was fascinated by how the human body developed. I came across the biography of a surgeon, Christian Bernard, He's renowned and known for having performed the first human-to-human -human heart transplant in the world in 1967 in Cape Town, South Africa. Interestingly, Christian Bernard actually spent some time here in Richmond at the Medical College of Virginia where he learned some of the skills that ended up, you know, leading to his ability to accomplish this feat. But while reading his biography, what really interested me the most wasn't just the accomplishments that he did in the field of transplantation and, and heart surgery, but buried within the text was some work he had done as a young surgeon, working on fetal animals to improve our understanding of how some anomalies develop in the fetus. You see, some babies are born with blockages to their intestines, what we call intestinal atresias. And Dr. Bernard and his colleagues at that time had been able to perform some surgery on fetal animals to to reproduce those anomalies, improving our understanding of how this occurs and helping us therefore better understand how to treat them. But what I, lead, what I really took out of that whole um, biography was the realization back then in 1980 that, wow, it's actually possible to go into the uterus, perform surgery, and have the pregnancy continue. Who knew? I had no idea that was possible. I was intrigued, I was fascinated. As I proceeded to medical school, still in Nigeria, at Obafemi Awolowo University in Ilefe, Nigeria, I developed a strong interest in, in embryology. That is the study of how the fetus goes from sperm and an egg all the way to a full-blown human. But the intrigue from the work of Dr. Bernard and his colleagues really pushed into me this sense of wanting to engage in the research and the discovery that could actually help shape the outcomes. Now I knew how the fetus was formed what about when things don't go right? How can we correct those anomalies? So I really had a very strong interest in research, and I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. Well, I found my way here to Richmond, Virginia. I was privileged to be in the surgical residency program at the Medical College of Virginia. This was one of the top surgical programs in the country, and I was honored to be mentored by pediatric surgeons like Arnold Salzberg, who prepared me for a career for the future in pediatric surgery. But in addition, part of the fascination for MCV then was the fact that I had the opportunity to engage in research, 
research that led to a PhD at Virginia Commonwealth University, research in fetal wound healing. You see, many of us here probably have bruises and cuts that we've sustained along the way. I just sustained one this morning while shaving. <laughs> but those cuts and bruises heal with a scar, a telltale sign of the encounter that we've had, either from bruises or injuries or, or accidents. Many of the scars we consider really inconsequential. But severe scars can form, especially from those who had burns with quite deforming and disfiguring scars that could be life-changing. And also when scars form in our internal organs from disease and infection, it can reduce their function and reduce our life expectancy. You see, what's really unique is that the fetus has an ability to heal without scar. And so in the laboratory then at MCV, with my mentors, Robert Diggerman and Kelman Cohen, who are actually able to look into ways to help unravel the mysteries of how the fetus is able to heal without scar. You see, each and every one of us at one point in our development had the ability to heal without scar. How nice would it be if we could bring that back and apply and help prevent the scars that we all develop? So here I was in Richmond, Virginia, now having the opportunity to study wound healing in the fetus. Here I was doing fetal surgery in animal models. The as science advanced and things improved, we realized that not only now were we able to do surgery in, in animal models, but fetal surgery could now actually be performed in humans for life-threatening conditions. The time I spent here led now to some work that I was able to do additional training in Philadelphia before finding myself in Houston, in, uh, Houston Texas at Texas Children's Hospital. There, I was fortunate to be surrounded by a team of talented surgeons, obstetricians, anesthesiologists, neonatologists, cardiologists, nurses, and many more, as we set up a fetal team that could care for patients with some of these complex conditions, patients like Lynn Lee Beamer. You see, I first met Lynn Lee when she, well, I first met Lynn Lee when she was just five months pregnant within her mother. Her, well, her mother was five months pregnant with Lynn Lee. <laughs> So Lily was just barely five months into her gestation when her mother presented to Texas Children's Hospital. You see, Lindy had a tumor growing off her tailbone. This was a sacrococcygeal teratoma. These tumors can be quite huge. They can grow to huge sizes off the tailbone, at times even as big as the fetus itself. You can imagine the fetal heart now has to pump blood not just to the tumor, but also to the rest of the body. This could, provide, this could really put a tremendous strain on the heart, and at times the heart fails, just overwhelmed by the amount of work it has to do. You see, over the years, we've been able to figure out which fetuses are likely to get in trouble as the, as the tumor gets bigger. Lindley was one of those fetuses. We had to do something. If we didn't intervene, we knew surely she was going to die in her mother's womb. Bravely, her mother, Margaret, agreed to undergo fetal surgery. So Margaret went, underwent fetal surgery, a procedure actually that required us to open her abdomen, open her uterus, gain access to the fetus, bring out Lindley's hindsight and look at the tumor. My hands are not small. And it gives you a scale just in the picture behind me how big that mass was. And again, looking at the little foot right next to it, you can imagine how big this tumor was essentially sucking the life out of this baby. We were able to partially resect that tumor, close back the uterus, close back Margaret's abdomen, and allow the pregnancy to continue. Bravely, Margaret continued the pregnancy for another 13 weeks until she was delivered by cesarean section at close to 37 weeks gestation. Lindy had been rescued from this huge tumor that was taking her life. She was now able to live a normal, vibrant life as we see her here when she was a year old of age. But fetal surgery is really not without risks. This is one of the few situations where you can perform one procedure and lose two patients. 
You see, brave patients like Margaret, Lindley's mother, are the ones that make this possible. You can imagine, we operate on these fetuses at about the fifth month of gestation. For tumors like Lindley, we have to make a huge incision on the uterus just to get that mass out. We then have to close this in a very meticulous manner and have the uterus continue to stay closed as the pregnancy continues. Now think about it. For those of you that have been pregnant, at five months, the uterus is only so big. It continues to grow all the way till nine months, putting tremendous tension and strain on the healing wound. Again, we're dealing here with a wound that's struggling to contain the stresses and tension around it. We therefore have to balance the risk to the mother with the potential benefit to the fetus. Because these mothers have that risk, not only for that pregnancy, but for all subsequent pregnancies. The risk is easy to understand for life-threatening conditions like Lindley's. But now we're doing fetal surgery for other non-life-threatening conditions like spina bifida. These are conditions in which the uh, fetus has the spine exposed, the spinal cord exposed. And over time, there's progressive injury to the nerves that will result in loss of function, loss of ability to walk, poor control of the urine, uh, poor control also of stool, and accumulation of fluid within the brain. We know that if we can do the surgery before birth and preserve the ongoing injury, we can restore function. But now performing more of this surgery for non-life-threatening conditions means we need to weigh the risks and benefit to the fetus and the mother. We need to see how we can improve the outcome for the fetus while still limiting the risk to the mother. We knew we had to do better. So one of the ways is to find out from our knowledge of wound healing, we know that the fetus, that even in the fetus, smaller wounds heal better than larger ones. So we had to find ways to avoid the big incisions that we're making on the uteruses of these women. One thought was actually to find a way that we could go in, again, what we generally do in the abdomen for those who have had surgery or, you know, of their gallbladder or different things, but to put little cameras, but this time into the uterus. So this had to be really small, tiny cameras through straw-like instruments into the uterus that we can vi visualize the fetus, but then also perform these delicate surgeries with tiny, fine, tiny, fine instruments to be able to perform the surgery in the mothers to provide the optimum results and benefit for the fetus while still reducing the risk to the mother. You see, my journey in the world of fetal surgery has been a journey of faith. It started with a hidden information buried in the text of the biography of Christian Bernard about his work on the fetus. It started with the hidden mysteries of fetal wound healing, of unraveling the issues related to wound healing and applying those to other aspects of life or of the work that we're dealing in. We know that the future of fetal surgery is going to be based on research, discovery, and innovation as that field continues to move forward. But for every one of you, if you just take a step back in your daily lives and look at your, your encounters, your interactions, the things that you do on, every day, on, on a daily basis, things that you interact with, people you interact with, things you get to do, that if you just take a step back, you can find some hidden information in there that would serve as the nidus to give solution to the problems of tomorrow. Again, I thank you for your time.